Hi there. Today I want to talk with you about two very sophisticated sociological theorists, uh, Michel Foucault and Jean Baudrillard. And they're both French men. Uh, they have both died. But the title of the chapter that Kenneth Allen has uh, for these two very um, large figures in social theory is upsetting reality, Foucault and Baudrillard. And I think the words upsetting reality capture things quite well because each of these men challenges the nature of reality. It ch they challenge the idea of uh, what we know. How do we know what we know? And what is truth? And how are humans implicated in the idea of truth, facts, uh, what we think is real. So Kenneth Allen himself even says at the beginning of the chapter that he has some frustration trying to experience uh, what Foucault is saying and he feels a sense of incompletion even as he wrote his ideas. However, uh, we can try and also, I think we can get a, a good start on some of the terminology that Foucault uses. And then I will get into Baudrillard and some of the uh, kind of wild ideas that he has about our present moment and whether or not we have lost contact with reality. So, to begin, uh, Michel Foucault was born in France and in 1960 uh, he published Madness and Civilization. Uh, he was very interested in uh, psychology and uh, also philosophy and managed to combine them in his first book and uh, was interested in these kinds of topics throughout his life. But he also uh, was uh, prolific in the types of interests that he had. So he studied many different social institutions. So the first one, madness and civilization, is really about, in some ways, the idea of um, what counts as mental illness, right? He earned his doctorate, which in Europe is a lot harder than it is uh, in the United States to do so. And in 1966, he published The Order of Things, which is, uh, I have a copy of here. And you can see the subtitle is An Archaeology of the Human Sciences. So this is, if I can read you a little bit from the back, it's been hailed as the most important French contribution to philosophy since Sartre. Its thesis is that man has only quite recently emerged as an object of our knowledge. Okay, man is in quotation marks. Our present concept of man is the result of a mutation within our culture. Foucault studies this mutation from the 17th century onward, cutting across numerous disciplines, first with the study of the classical human sciences, and then with an analysis of their 19th, 19th century successors, philology, biology, and political economy. Okay. Um, so, uh, already you can see, very complex, uh, within four years of writing this dense work, he uh, earned a permanent post at the College de France, and then uh, within less than ten years, wrote probably my favorite book of his, Discipline and Punish, The Birth of the Prison. And we'll talk a little bit more about this and Jeremy Bentham's notion of a panopticon. In 1976, he published his first volume of the History of Sexuality. And this is a very slim book. It runs a total of 160 pages or so. In 1984, the last two volumes of that three-volume work, The History of Sexuality, were published just before he died, and he died of AIDS in 1984. What is Foucault about? Kenneth Allen promotes this idea that Foucault looks at truth and things like how power is exercised through knowledge or truth and how truth is formed through practice. Here's a line that I liked. Something can only be false 
once a specific truth is assumed. In other words, we all have assumptions about the world. And those assumptions allow us to see certain things as true and other things as false. So Foucault is involved in uncovering how truth is assumed. The game of truth, the rules, resources, and practices that go into making something true for humans. So like we talked about with Garfinkel, the idea of like ethno-methodology, you know, how do we understand the world in Garfinkel's terms? What accounts do we use to explain the world to ourselves and others? Foucault is interested in this as well, but he's much more of an historian and he looks at historical documents to trace the evolution of our ideas of what counts as true. And to that end, we can talk about the notion of a counter-history. And as I've listed here, it says the uh, idea of history that's different from the progressive linear memory model. So there's this old idea of capital H history, which is a history that, if I can draw on this slide for a second, it moves from point A over to point B, and there's a clear relationship between the first part and the second part that can be explained through narrative or a story, um, that it's progressive, that there's incremental change, and especially in science, the idea that we have cumulative knowledge, that we're getting smarter. Uh, I talked to you about this a long time ago, but as a refresher, you might recall we talked about paradigms and Thomas Kuhn's work. Foucault and Kuhn have some things in common. One of them is the idea that truth is relative to the discourses, the scientific discourses, the medical discourses, the legal discourses that give rise to certain truths that say this is true. And a counter history, using Foucault's terms, is a history that's really different from this progressive linear memory model where everything is explainable and makes sense in a certain order. As an example of this, I wanted to show you one of his books that he edited, and it's got a, a very evocative title. I, Pierre Riviere, having slaughtered my mother, my sisters, and my brother. <laughs> um, this is a story of a fellow who killed his father and his mother and himself in 1835. What this book has is many different documents in it about how that murder occurred and how it can be explained. Um, here's the description. The relevant documents of the case are included, such as medical and legal testimony police records, and Riviere's memoir itself. This case, Foucault points out, occurred at a time when many professions were contending for status and power. Medical authority was challenging law. Branches of government were vying. Foucault's reconstruction of the case is a brilliant exploration of the roots of our contemporary views of madness, justice, and crime. So these are competing institutions and competing discourses concerning how we are to understand things like madness. Is it psychological? How do we deal with it in law? Is it a medical condition? And through these different documents, it's revealed how the people at the time had no idea how to make sense of this. Uh, let me give you some quotes from uh, this book. I think that what committed us to this work, and that is the, the authors in the book trying to analyze uh, Pierre Riviere's uh, case, I think what committed us to the work, despite all our differences of interests and approaches, was that it was a dossier, that is to say, a case, an affair, an event, that provided the intersection of discourses that differed in origin, form, organization, and function. Here it is. Uh, in their totality and in their variety, they form neither a composite work 
nor an exemplary text, but rather a strange contest, a confrontation, a power relation. Separate combat, com I'm sorry, separate combats were being fought out at the same time and intersected each other. Documents like those in the Rivieri case should provide material for a thorough examination of the way in which a particular kind of knowledge, medicine, psychiatry, psychology, is formed and acts in relations to institutions and the roles prescribed in them. Law with respect to the expert, the accused, the criminally insane, and so on. They give us a key to the relations of power, domination, and conflict within which discourses emerge and function. In presenting the documents, we've refrained from a typical typological method, such as the court file followed by the medical file. We've rearranged them to more or less chronological order around the events that they are bound up with, the crime, the examining judge's investigation, the proceedings, the commutation of sentence. This throws a good deal of light on the confrontation of various types of discourse and the rules that result from this confrontation. So hopefully that gives you a, a bit of a taste for some of Foucault's project and how he's upsetting, uh, in some ways, some of our basic ideas of reality. How do we come up with the terms and concepts and social categories of knowledge that we take for granted today? And in doing that, he creates an archaeology. Uh, this is his book, the archaeology of knowledge. And the way that this can be defined, Alan is smart, he says, it seems to be oriented toward the uncovering, I'm sorry, toward uncovering the relationships among social institutions, practices, and knowledge that come to produce a particular kind of discourse or structure of thought. And a discourse is simply a way of talking about something. But again, what are the relationships among these social institutions, the practices, the knowledge they create in ways of talking and in structuring thought? And that also for Foucault relates to genealogy. And this is something, again, Alan tentatively defines as the inscription of discourses on the mind and body. So what happens then if you are deemed mentally ill, that's a way of talking and a way of knowing that informs how you are physically viewed, the way that people make sense of you and you make sense of yourself. So already I hope you can see uh, the complexity of Foucault as a thinker. Foucault then wants to promote hidden histories and counter stories. So not just the received history of how things are or how they evolved, but showing in fact that things didn't have to uh, go the way they did and that there might be many competing ways of knowing that suddenly sort of emerged into a certain way that was taken for granted as promoting capital T truth. Uh, here's uh, another book of his, The Birth of the Clinic, an archaeology of medical perception. So in this instance, I'll read you a little from the back. In the 18th century, medicine underwent a mutation. For the first time, medical knowledge took on a precision that had formerly belonged to only to mathematics. The body became something that could be mapped. Disease became subject to new rules of classification. And doctors began to describe phenomena that for centuries had remained below the threshold of the visible and expressible. So he's very interested in reopening how we got to the place we, got, we are at today in terms of what counts as truth and the power behind discourses and ways of knowing. One smart way of thinking about this is uh, the idea of grids, blank spaces, and transgressions. Um, these allow us to consider that things might not be as they seem. And a transgression means, in some ways, just a violation. So, as an example, 
of a transgression. Alan tells a story that you can imagine a boy of three or four years of age playing. Uh, he's been given toys. He's emulating role models he sees on TV and the kids in his neighborhood. One day his dad comes home and finds him playing with a doll. His dad grabs the toy away and tells his son that, son that boys do not play with dolls. So in this instance, the category of gender was invisible until the young boy attempted to cross over a boundary, until his transgression, and until he jumped the space between categories. So the quote from Foucault here, it says, the meaning and power of gender waited, quote, in silence for the moment of its expression. So gender itself doesn't exist until we make that case to that little boy. Oh, here, you did this wrong. And in a way, again, that relates directly to Garfinkel, this notion that we don't think about these rules and the way that these categories are created until we see something wrong. Then they come into mind. But he, Foucault, talks about the power involved with creating these categories and discourses and that they legitimate certain types of arrangements. So these spaces, like the gendered spaces we just talked about, ideas, categories, are the result of historical construction. Certain periods of time produce certain ways of thinking. Science hasn't been around since the beginning of humanity. It had to come out of certain discourses and ideas that were counter to others. Foucault also is what's considered a post-structuralist, and post-structuralism simply means after structuralism. So structuralists were very much into um, order, and Foucault is, if you can see from these examples, he's playing with order, trying to deconstruct the way we make sense of things. And so his focus largely is on language. And as I've said in other words above, uh, he's considering the social world as fragmented and historically specific. To go back to this book, um, the, the different institutions and people in those institutions are vying to make sense of things. Uh, so they're fragmented, but it's also a murder that happened in a particular history at a particular point in time. What that means, though, is that Foucault is saying there really is no general unifying theory like you have promoted under the Enlightenment. He's deconstructing all of these things that, even though we think of it as a linear history, really it falls apart upon closer inspection. He says that the human world and knowledge are utterly textual. Now, what does that mean? Texts are things that are read, interpreted. And what that means then is nothing is as it is. Everything is a text, meaning everything is open to interpretation and reading. So there is nothing that is essentially real. It's interpreted and understood by people. And that means that we humans have to make sense of the world as a series of texts. Texts and language do not have a single true underlying meaning. We have to interpret them. So the meaning of human subjects is, in, in fact, an historically specific discourse. And that produces particular types of bodies and subjectivities. That means particular types of people who physically live in particular ways. Think of how differently you live today in a world that accepts medicine and science, you live in a very different kind of way. Your body is very different than if you would have lived in the Middle Ages where you didn't have science or medicine in the same ways at all that we think about today. So that's what he's saying. It creates different kinds of bodies, physical bodies, and also subjectivities, ways of understanding the world. All right, so Foucault is dealing with knowledge and power, and he's got some key ideas. 
that power is dispersed. Power isn't necessarily centralized, but it's constantly shifting and being fought for and claimed by different people using different discourses, and it's in flux. But he wants to look at how power is organized um, and also simultaneously dispersed. Uh, it's something that is all around us in different ways. And this idea that knowledge is power. Um, if you know something, then you have a claim to truth. And you have a claim to understanding, which can be linked to institutions that can do things. And these phrases, power is dispersed, knowledge is power, are really key ideas for Foucault. Also, power is insidious. Now, what does insidious mean? I think of it as like a kind of like a creeping evil, <clears throat> like a, 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 a force uh, that's not good, uh, that m pushes its way gradually into lives and things. So power is insidious and it is part of our life in ways we can't kind of understand. It acts by imperceptible degrees. And I have here an example. If you think of your day as a college student and the ways that power and knowledge are fused at the university in creating you as a particular type of person. Let's think about it for a second. If you go to a class, you probably sit in a room with many other students. You have someone like me who is supposed to be the leader, the person in charge, the professor, the one who professes, the one who knows. And that person is supposed to direct you to texts that tell what truth is. You are by and large supposed to memorize that information, understand it, and be able to use it later. And then what happens is that sets up a certain idea of who has truth, who can access truth, and what you can do with that truth, that knowledge. So what happens then is ultimately your teacher may or may not be correct, but holds the power of deciding what is or is not correct through something like, for example, an examination. And that means that even though the truth that's being expressed may not be true, uh, the power is implicated in that thing being considered true in that context. I hope that made sense. But what happens then is that all the way through your day, you are encountering forces uh, that are claiming to know and are claiming power, the ability to marshal resources um, based on the things that they know. And this is, I think, a great insight for people to consider. Uh, how is knowledge to some extent relative to power structures? And how is it that some people are kept out of the idea of being knowledgeable because they don't connect with a power structure. In other words, you get a credential from a university, right? So that university institution is sort of backing you and saying, yes, this person went through our process of knowing. We affirm it. They're all right. And therefore, you can work in certain other institutions that recognize that kind of knowledge. So the way that power works is diffused and insidious uh, through knowledge. Then we come to the idea of an epistem, and that again relates to the previous slide, the way knowledge organizes itself in any historical moment. This is an example from Foucault's own writing, and it's this idea of a story that he's reading a book containing a Chinese categorical system. And what it does, the system divides animals into those, quote, belonging to the emperor, embalmed, tame, suckling pigs, sirens, fabulous, stray dogs, included in the present classifications, frenzied innumerable, 
drawn with fine camel brush hair. Um, and Foucault has this lovely line here. He says that once he's reading this, he's impressed with the idea that he would never have thought of that way of categorizing things. He calls it, quote, the stark impossibility of thinking that. You know, who would think that? It's a classification system that apparently was in place at a particular time and historical moment. And that is this notion of episteme. And science is also related to episteme. It says we're incrementally increasing our knowledge. We're improving it. We're getting smarter. But how are our categories and ways of making sense in some ways any different from that Chinese classification system? There's a certain arbitrariness to each of the systems. Foucault says that in that instance, our knowledge is really linked to patterns of behavior. Those categories for the Chinese um, people in this system must have made sense in some way in relation to their lives. So our knowledge is linked to patterns of behavior, institutional arrangements, economic and social practices. And, and this relates back to Thomas Kuhn we talked about before and the structures of scientific revolutions, paradigms. Our knowledge is not gained incrementally, but it's marked by ruptures, discontinuities, and radical shifts. Okay? Suddenly we'll have a change of mind. A new institution will develop, and we will reorganize things. Think of how differently people made sense of mental illness in the Middle Ages compared to in the 1800s compared to today. We've had a complete change of thinking about how mental illness works and those are ruptures, radical discontinuities and shifts. That leads nicely into discourse. Discourse, as I mentioned before, is just a way of talking about things. So when I talk about discourses related to homelessness, for example, I can say some discourses promote the idea that homeless people are themselves to blame for their condition. They're lazy, crazy, mentally ill, uh, stupid, that these people have something wrong with them. There are other discourses about homelessness that say homelessness is the result of structural factors, unemployment, a very expensive housing market, uh, no easy to access mental health services for poor people. Okay, So these are discourses, they organize rules and practices that give us a language to think in and a way to talk. So you'll hear people say, Oh, those homeless people, you know, they're really, um, they deserve their homelessness. You know, they're not going to get help. They're too stupid to figure it out. You might have another discourse about homelessness that says, well, you know, those homeless people, they're victims of a system. You know, this system is hurting them. It's a totally different way of thinking about that condition. So, Discourses determine the position that a person is going to occupy in becoming the subject of a statement. All right. So if I say to you, I see you today and I'm seeing you wear, let, let's say you're a man, and I see a, you've got some designer sweater on, I say, gee, that sweater isn't very manly. Suddenly, I've introduced a discourse which says you are supposed to dress in a particular way related to our cultural ideas at this particular moment of what gender is and how it should be physically shown to people, articulated in clothes. So that's how people become subjects of statements and discourses. All right, so the last slide and a half on Foucault. I just talked about discourses with you. We locate ourselves within a discourse and become subject to the discourse. What does that mean? Just like I said about the example of someone, a man wearing a sweater and another man saying, oh, that's not a very manly sweater. That discourse, that way of talking, locates that person within the discourse. The discourse says, you are a man and there are gendered expectations as to how you should act. And it's saying you are subject 
to those rules. You're subject to that discourse. So you can think about how this happens all the time. If, for example, you're watching a commercial and the commercial shows a woman and she's eating Special K, that is a particular discourse, you could argue, about what women should do, what types of food women should eat, how they should be thinking about their body, the way they look, and have a certain kind of concern about themselves differently than men. So there are all kinds of discourses around us. Um, discourses regarding commercialism, um, discourses regarding sex and gender. At the university, discourses regarding which disciplines are more important or less important. And you have to think about this, I think, to, to get it, but once you do, it's a mind blower. Think about all the different subject positions you occupy throughout your day and the different discourses you encounter. If you work at a job, that's a subject position, right? You're subject underneath uh, an employer, and the employer might say to you, um, I want you to uh, sweep that floor. Um, you've just been created as a, a certain type of subject who has to do what this person asks. Um, perhaps you can negotiate it, but the discourse itself is where the power lies. So if you're a worker, there are certain discourses at work. If you're a husband or wife, there are discourses about how you are supposed to act, uh, what your relationship is supposed to be like with your spouse and or kids if you have those. There are discourses about how you should be a parent and how you should not be a parent. Uh, if you go driving, there are discourses about how you should drive in terms of what's legal and illegal, and you can be subject to law enforcement. Uh, it goes on and on and on. So discourse, ways of talking for Foucault, is usually the first step long, long, long before coercive force is used, coercive power that says you will do this, or physical force. So discourse like, oh, that isn't a very manly sweater, that might cause you to discipline yourself. And the person doesn't have to do anything. They've set the, the train in mind, right? They've set the idea in your mind about, oh, I need to consider how I am being in relation to a whole set of practices. I'm apparently not meeting up with those practices. So discourse contains a will to power. That means that power is in the discourse and in the people who use it to facilitate to some extent control over other people, to channel them in different ways of acting and thinking. And that relates to governmentality. The government of the self, by the self, in its articulation with relations to others. What a lovely phrase. The government, right, the controlling of the self by the self. Think about that. What self is being controlled there? It's fascinating. The, the self becomes this thing that controls itself. You're in a relation with all the discourses of power around you and what you will take on and what you will say, no, I'm not willing to do that right? Because that's what makes you an individual. So the government of the self, by the self, in its articulation with relations to others. In some ways, the heart of sociology, uh, things like the I-me dialogue, the id, ego, and superego. What's our relationship to controlling ourselves in terms of others and their expectations of us? So Foucault says that governmentality rose up in the shift from the power of the monarch to the power of the state. The monarch is, as we've talked about before, a king or a queen, right? Uh, the monarch got their power from God. The state, the state is the power of an entire a nation state government. And so therefore, the power is more diffused. It wasn't just centralized with this monarch who gets power from God. And what starts to happen is, as time has progressed to today, 
and power is decentralized. Remember, power is dispersed. So what's happened these days is many, many instances, you control yourself. And discourses are the way that you control yourself. Jean-Paul Sartre, a famous philosopher, had this great phrase. He said, we forget how free we are. And that's the idea here. You dress appropriately, you say appropriate things, you even edit your own thoughts based on the discourses, perceptions of the people around you, their needs, and what you ought to do. And the model that shows this, that Foucault uses, is something called the Panopticon in his book Discipline and Punish, The Birth of the Prison. Let me show you a Panopticon and then explain. Panopticon, it refers to a design by Jeremy Bentham, who is an Enlightenment philosopher. And it's the notion of a central guard tower. Here, I'll put an arrow here. Uh, a central guard tower surrounded by prison cells in a circle. So, Bentham argued that we are uh, utilitarian, that we seek pleasure and avoid pain. We've talked about before. The idea is that criminals apparently did not get the message that they ought not do certain things. All right, And so what Bentham is promoting with this prison design is the idea that the prisoners through this tower, like I drew before, are constantly being watched that is supposed to impress upon them that their actions are being scrutinized all the time and that they need to stop doing bad behavior. So for Foucault, brilliant, he basically says that the panopticon is the new model for self-control and social order. You don't do things that are antisocial on the web because you may be caught you stick with certain patterns of being because if you deviate from them you might well pay a price and so it's no longer that as the story the first story he tells in here uh, it's no longer that people are burned at the stake he tells this riveting story of a fellow who was burned at the stake uh, as a punishment in the middle ages right instead the punishments are taken away from the public view and they're now in prisons where the idea is reforming the mind of the person that really you control yourself and in some ways you create your own prison. So that's part of the notion of governmentality and Foucault's ideas about how socialization affects us and allows us to have a place in the world that we in some ways create and we in some ways are very much constricted by based on our thinking. Our next social theorist, Jean Baudrillard, is also French and he uh, is upsetting reality in a very different way than Michel Foucault. Um, he's toward the end of his life writing texts that seem to um, say that reality is really a fantasy these days. So uh, we'll have fun talking about him. He was born in France, again, like Foucault. Uh, however, he studied German at the Sorbonne, a very famous school in France. He became a professor of German for eight years before deciding to take on a whole other subject area. Uh, he began studying sociology and philosophy and eventually taught sociology beginning in 1966 and became a professor of sociology at the University of Paris. He was very prolific, as most of the people you'll probably have noticed at this point are in your textbook. I only have two books of his here, um, but he wrote many, many, many. Uh, this is one of his more famous ones, uh, Simulacra and Simulation. Uh, this is a book, a travel book he wrote about his visit to America, um, which is 
fun. It's got some pictures in it and uh, a lot of funny detail. To understand Baudrillard, there's a, a, a way you can go through his four phases of the sign that I think will help make sense of why he thinks we are uncoupled from reality today. He starts off, and you can start off thinking about, the um, pre-modern society, pre-capitalist society, and the idea of symbolic exchange. All right. So before capitalism, how did symbolic exchange work? It's one of the four phases of the sign. The first phase is that pre-modern society. In those societies, you didn't have text. You had face-to-face -face encounters. So there was no writing. There was not really literacy. You know, this is just um, exchanges uh, people have with each other face-to-face. -face. Okay. So in these contexts, Baudrillard says, Signs represent reality. So these signs are expressive of some social reality. So here's the, the idea here. Communicative acts were directly related to and expressive of social reality, what Baudrillard calls symbolic exchange. Down here on the slide, the exchange of gifts, actions, signs, and so on, for their symbolic rather than their material value. What matters is what the ritualized actions symbolize for the group. Symbolic exchange formed part of daily life in pre-capitalist societies. The exchange of food, jewelry, titles, clothing were all involved in a symbolic cycle of gifts and counter gifts. Symbolic exchange thus established a community of symbolic meanings and reciprocal relations. So you just saw the first phase of the sign. The second phase is based on the European Renaissance and goes up to the Industrial Revolution. So it's a second historic period. In this period, Baudrillard claims that we're moving away from the previous direct kinds of symbolic relationships. And to make that case, he says that the scientific way of understanding the world is starting to grow. And examples of this can be found in art, where they're containing the values of mathematics and perspective. Direct representation is still present, but these ideals, human ideals, are beginning to make inroads. Art, like I just said, mathematical balance, perspective, and you can see it in things like da Vinci's paintings. Um, there are mystery and uh, there's intrigue uh, within these works as well. So there's a, a distancing of the symbol from that meaning that it existed in the pre-modern society. We're starting to see a separation between the meaning and the sign, the symbol itself. The third phase from the Industrial Revolution, which you can you know, roughly say is like 1750, 1850 era starts in there, uh, up to World War II, you see the beginning of consumer society. And the second phase, uh, you see use value and exchange value, okay? Uh, so in this second phase above, Marx's notions of use and exchange value are present. So what use can you make of an object? What can you exchange that object for? It has different value in those ways. And Marx said those ideas explain capitalism's inherent exploitation. But Baudrillard says that in this new third phase here, from the Industrial Revolution to World War II, people are buying things less for their use value. And exchange value is not about human labor 
and the level of exploitation or surplus value. Okay? It isn't about the amount of labor that's put into an object anymore that allows for its increase in value. What's happening in this era is commodities are purchased and used for their sign value. So again, this is a new era, a third stage. They're fetishes. You might remember Marx's idea of commodity fetishism, right? That we start to um, love commodities in and of themselves, and um, we forget that we've created them. And they seem to take on a kind of a magical um, presence for us. So what we do these days is we don't say, oh, this Nike shirt is useful or oh I can exchange this Nike shirt for something else we say oh the Nike shirt has inherent value because it has this symbol the sign value it's a fetish we fall in love with Nike and we read the identity of these products through brand names and their place within the commodity system a Nike product is probably better than a generic product we think to ourselves that's why in part it has more value to us, it's more expensive. So what's happening in this instance is that the signs are proliferating, but there really isn't any substance behind them. It's marketing campaigns and it's trying to develop notions of how you feel about products rather than anything inherently different about the products themselves. So, in the third era uh, of the sign, you see that use value and exchange value are, they're still around, they haven't disappeared, of course, but you also see the emergence of something new, which is sign value. Sign value means that these products are sold in a commercialized environment, the name brands have meaning to people, and we're starting to see a separation between the actual physical things and the meanings that those things carry. That brings us to this fourth era where things get fun. World War II to today. You might remember I connected World War II with the emergence of the late modern or the postmodern era after the modern. So some people also call this the emergence of post-industrial societies no longer based on industrialization but on information so we have the information age, the rise of computers satellite communications, etc. Baudrillard points out that we have increasing communication technology these days meaning that um, again cell phones, televisions, computers, um, satellites, fiber optic cables uh, allow us to be in touch with people all over the world very, very quickly through images and sounds. And we also have the ever presence of mass media connected directly with that communication technology. So today, if you want to, in the course of your day, you can note how many times you encounter mass media. And it's rather shocking. If you go to the student union, you might see televisions on, you might hear music from a radio or a CD. Um, you might see magazines. So we are bombarded with mass media today. Some people argue it's colonized our world. And that's something you can think about, um, how much mass media you encounter, how much it affects your thinking. Anyway, these trends relate for Baudrillard to a new moment where today's signs reference nothing but themselves. So now you have things that are really their own entities. Uh, to some extent the Nike swoosh might reference clothing or shoes or sports equipment, but it might also represent a connection with elite athletes who are being sponsored by Nike. And so maybe it's connected with success or determination. But then suddenly if Tiger Woods, who was a big spokesperson for Nike, is involved in a sex scandal, then maybe Nike takes on another kind of idea or meaning. So there are these free-floating signifiers, out, if you will, out there. Signs reference nothing but themselves. And today, 
simulation rules. So what is simulation? If you have, say, a, a flight simulator, this is a little contraption that's designed to simulate or pretend like you're flying, to give you the feeling of flying, the environment of flying, but not in a real plane that could involve real danger. Simulation rules today. Uh, authentic experience is commodified, and the examples that Baudrillard uses are things like Disneyland, theme parks, Las Vegas. So what you do is you'll go to Las Vegas and you'll see Paris, this hotel named Paris. It's designed like Paris in France. It has a three-quarter size Arc de Triomphe, it has a little uh, Eiffel Tower, and there are people who go there and they say, well I can't make it to Paris, so I've gone to Paris. And it confuses people, you know. The idea of what's real starts to become rather odd. Uh, another example, kids sometimes see old-time uh, towns, little tiny towns, if they're from a big city, and they see these on uh, movies. And then they go to a real small town, and they say, wow, this is just like that small town in the movies, without realizing that those kinds of small towns were the basis for the small towns in the movies. You see my point. We're getting things confused. Um, Disneyland, in some ways, you know, represents nothing but itself. And theme parks are these ideas of uh, some elaborated theme that's connected with a place, and these again were kind of ubiquitous in Las Vegas. Uh, you had the New York, New York Hotel Casino, which was designed like the skyline of New York, uh, but also inside having, you know, machines and casinos to take your money. So simulation rules. Things are not as they seem, and we have virtual simulators. Um, people have um, simulations that we'll be able to see, I hope, in a movie you'll be able to watch on um, this course, during this course. Um, basically, Baudrillard is arguing that reality has been completely transformed, and postmodernity huh, means the end of everything. Uh, rather kind of shocking and bleak claim. But uh, what counts as reality these days? Uh, if any of you have ever seen that television show about people who think they're in a relationship, um, but they're not. Uh, I'm forgetting the name of the show right now, but they're in uh, virtual kinds of relationships, and it turns out that the people they think they're dating are not real people. Um, that's one example. Uh, it has the word fish in it. Ah, I wish I could remember the title. Anyway, um, reality TV. That's an oxymoron. You, you can't have reality TV. Even though it's supposed to be based on reality, it's edited, constructed, it's created, and made to seem like perhaps more than is going on. All the boring parts are taken out. Okay, So that's what we mean by simulations. Um, is it a real person singing, or are they lip-syncing? These kinds of things. For Baudrillard, Transferring information means changing it. Information always goes through a medium. And that means that you put something through a medium, it's going to be transformed. So mass communications mean that the meanings are transformed. Information Kenneth Allen talks about simulacrum as an image of an image of a reality that never existed and never appears. Perhaps one example would be if you were to watch um, kids who are on a television commercial and they're advertising clothing. Maybe they're real, real kids who someone's found uh, and like the products that they're 
using. But the strange thing is, is that that use of that product has been picked up and manipulated in an ad so that it really doesn't relate to reality. It's a snippet. It's used for a particular purpose to communicate that this product is worth having, right? And maybe that this product is for real people. But the irony is, is that they're using a sort of fake advertisement-based enhanced communication model, which has no basis in reality, in order to promote the idea that these genes are authentic and real. So you see the issue. Endless copies without an original referent. Uh, today we have what are called free-floating signifiers. They're not attached to anything. They've been cut loose from their social and linguistic context. Their meaning is at best problematic and generally non-existent. So this notion uh, of things being unattached to anything, uh, I think it's fantastic. One of the things that uh, Kenneth Allen talks about is digital music today is maybe an example of this. Digital music is um, a, a recording, a digital recording that can be reproduced over and over and over again without any real loss of quality because the digital code is exactly the same. So it becomes a question of, well, which one's the original recording? Well, if they're all indecipherable, is there an original recording? And that's the kind of crazy moment that we're in now where things don't have meaning in terms of authenticity. Uh, you can get to a point where there really is no authenticity. Um, is a dollar bill real money? Or if that's the case, then why is it that the Treasury can suddenly say, we're going to introduce millions of dollars into the economy simply by hitting a few keys on a computer that then transfers those ones and zeros to a bank? What is real money, right? And so we're in a very strange historic period, one that Baudrillard characterizes as hyper-reality. And again, you see the idea of things like Disneyland and Las Vegas. Uh, simulacrum, it says here, can include things like artificial Christmas trees, plastic Christmas trees, uh, breast implants, okay, airbrushed Playboy bunnies. These are the examples that um, Alan gives about hyper-reality. Um, the idea of buying a plastic tree uh, as a replacement for real trees. Uh, there's something kind of bizarre about that. Um, and we do this all the time. Uh, we basically have a lot of uh, fake stuff in our culture that we take on as real. People will say, oh, do you have a Christmas tree? You'll say yes. You won't say, oh, I have a fake Christmas tree, right? So this is how confused we are. Uh, another example here uh, women and men who strive for an ideal body that really doesn't exist. So this notion that we are supposed to look uh, a particular way, which is an ideal physical type, that really is somewhat impossible in reality. Uh, Barbie, for example, the doll, uh, they've done studies about how those proportions would be nearly impossible for a woman to achieve, but many women think of Barbie as a kind of an ideal type of how they should be as a woman. So Baudrillard's saying that the meaning of signs has imploded. They've fallen on themselves, fallen in on themselves. Identities, institutions, all kinds of stable or once stable meanings are in flux and untethered. Uh, you could argue that this is one example of it. You're right now taking a university course. Uh, you're doing it online. Uh, this isn't a face-to-face -face class. But you can make the case that um, is this a real course? It's certainly very different from college courses that have been offered in the past. So what constitutes a real course? And what constitutes learning? What is taking a course? You see how these things are, are very different these days. Um, there aren't set meanings anymore. We have a lot of changes that are happening that make it so that we're really not sure 
what is real and what isn't. And we act as if some things are real when they're not. Baudrillard was a fascinating fellow. He relished in an extreme position when he says basically it's the end of everything, signs have imploded, um, then basically this idea that um, it's all breaking down. Um, the idea that he enjoyed being provocative seems to be uh, the case. He, he seemed to relish circular logic and very funny kinds of ways of expressing himself. If you ever get to read original Baudrillard, uh, I think you'll find it very uh, confusing and also funny. Um, his theory can therefore be seen as serious and as playful. So he's relishing in things like spectacle and passivity and in play and he ultimately it's a little disconcerting because he seems to be suggesting that there really isn't a possibility for meaningful political action or social policy. Uh, we have lost a, a sense of reality and for Baudrillard we're not going back. And I'll show you evidence of that or maybe examples of that in the next couple slides with some pictures. So here is an example of a simulation simulacra and hyperreality. Perhaps you've heard of these destroyed genes. This is a type of gene that's manufactured normally and then they're placed in stress situations where uh, files are applied or rubbing devices are applied in specific ways to make it seem as though they are prematurely worn. All right, So you can see, uh, let's see, I, I can kind of point here to, you can see the the types of wear marks, here I'll circle this one, that um, are put on these what were otherwise new genes and they're rubbed and they're made to look as if they're aged. So how is this simulacra? In the past the genes that were seen as worn in and kind of cool were genes that you would break in. You would wear them in uh, to a state where they were comfortable and uh, they seemed like they were a little damaged and that was cool that was seen as oh yeah you don't have a brand new pair of jeans that are stiff and you know very straight laced so they were seen as as it says here edgy cool you know something that was connected with um, youth culture and with a kind of devil may care attitude about life right you can go around looking like that now what's happened is people are not wearing out their jeans. Well, they still are, but there are also people, and this is where it gets funky, there are people who are paying money for jeans that look like they have been worn out, right? So there's no original referent for these things. They're all mass-produced, damaged jeans. It's simulacra at its finest. It's hyper-reality. Are they damaged jeans? Well, are they damaged if you bought them that way? Did you pay for this damage? Um, a previous generation, my parents in particular, would look at anyone who would buy a pair of jeans that already had holes in them as those people are insane, right? Um, yet, this is, as it says in the ad here, destroyed denim for edgy style cool. Uh, the, the idea of what the jeans are for, their uh, use value, their exchange value, uh, has been completely decoupled from what they symbolize, which has no basis in the reality of real workers or people who would break their genes down over time. So this is my first example of simulacra and hyperreality. The next one will add further to my case. Now we see how strange things can get today. You just saw an example of simulacra, endless copies without an original referent, that these genes are mass produced but maybe with slightly different tears and rub marks to indicate some type of process of breaking in that never actually existed. All right, So that's a level of weird that my parents could never understand. Why would you buy genes that 
are already damaged. It would not make sense to them. Here's where it gets weirder still. In this thing called Second Life, you have what are called avatars. Second Life is a place where you uh, experience virtual reality, an environment of virtual reality. So your avatar is a figure that's like yourself, like a, a human being. You can change it, you can make it look different than you. But it wanders around in this environment along with all kinds of other avatars that are supposed to be representatives of other people. And you can talk with them, interact with them, you can buy things on their market, and they even have a special currency called Linden Dollars. You can take American dollars and buy this virtual currency that allows you to buy things and sell things in Second Life. So, in Second Life, if you have, I think it says here, like 75 Linden dollars, then you can buy your own destroyed genes. They don't exist in reality, and they don't exist in Second Life, except as these weird images of fashion, which have no reference to anything. So, if you want to pay real money to buy destroyed jeans that will be worn by your avatar, welcome to the hypermodern age.